Welcome to the first of many mini-lectures intended as a guide to success for church history class. Here's what I'm going to do in this one. First, I'm going to give you a fast overview of the structure of the whole course. Then I'm going to give you some background on our first unit, the early church. And then finally, I'm going to give some specifics about our reading for our second class period, the passion of Saints Perpetua and Felicity. History is a lot messier than this, but historians like to make order out of events. And so it's pretty standard to divide all of Christian history into these four major periods. The early church, beginning with around the year 30 AD, that would mark the death and resurrection of Christ, and therefore the beginning of the Christian church, through the year 478. Don't worry about the significance of that date. The next period is referred to either as the Middle Ages or the Medieval Period, and it is mega in length, okay? It runs roughly from the 6th century through the 15th century, a thousand years. We will learn the subdivisions when we get to that point. Then we hit everybody's favorite period, the Reformation. It's a mere century in length, but so much happened. 16th century, okay? Finally, we have the modern period, this roughly the 17th to the middle of the 20th century. We'll also have um, stuff from the latter half of the 20th century. This is a chapter that is titled in our textbook, Voices for the Future. And you might know, you might have heard the phrase postmodern. That's the period in which we are living now. One more note. Our main methodology for studying church history in this class is not reading about what happened, but reading what we call primary texts, documents that were written during the period that we are studying. I am convinced that reading primary text is a much more interesting way to learn about church history rather than just memorizing a bunch of facts and events. I hope you'll agree. The Early Church, Diversity, Division, Dominion. This is the title of Chapter 2 in our textbook by Rebecca Moore. I'll have more to say about each of the D words, diversity, division, and dominion, in a bit. What I want to talk about here is the geographic context. All of the authors of our primary text from this period lived within the Roman Empire, which controlled all the territory around the Mediterranean Sea for centuries. This particular map uh, marks the limits of the empire in the year 117, but it's pretty much the same through the vast majority of the early period that we are studying. On this map, you can see the pockets of Christianity throughout the empire. Note the sections in the darker peach color, mostly clustered around major cities. These areas were predominantly Christian by the year 325. The lighter peach was predominantly Christian by the year 600. In other words, what was the entire Roman Empire by the year 600 has become at least nominally Christian. Rebecca Moore, author of our textbook, has these three themes to the chapter, diversity, division, and dominion. She discusses diversity among early Christians, both in their practices and their beliefs. We'll read the Gospel of Thomas, an early gospel that didn't make it into the New Testament, as an example of the diversity of beliefs within early Christianity. Divisions. By the time we get to the 4th century, we'll discover some of the controversies over beliefs and practices and learn about the winners and losers. Our middle illustration is a quote from the Council of Ephesus naming one of the losers, Nestorius. We'll read from a really fun piece titled Superman to get at some of those issues in the 4th and 5th century. Finally, Dominion. The picture in the lower right gives us a little hint to this. This is the Emperor Constantine, 
More about him and his dominion later. To illustrate the early diversity of belief and practice, Moore uses the images of many rivulets converging into three major streams. The illustration on our left helps us with this. You read this illustration from the top to the bottom chronologically. So the early church is at the top. And you can kind of see, I've put in the arrows to help us see those three major streams. If you look first at the arrow pointing to the left, and if you squint hard, you'll see that that says Roman Catholic. That's one of the three major streams. And then if you move your eyes uh, over to the right side of that image and look at the arrow pointing down, there's the uh, stream, the other second major stream of Orthodox Christianity. And then finally, moving further down, because we're moving further chronologically, we have the Protestants appearing in the 15th century uh, with the arrow pointing to the right. And it just looks crazy after that. The, but if you look at the image on the right-hand side, then you see a, li a little more cleanly. Um, here it shows, and this one reads chronologically from left to right. So you see early Christianity on the far left as a single trunk as opposed to this diversity that Moore emphasizes. So you have the single trunk and then you'll notice the um, blue branch is Eastern Orthodoxy and the red branch is Roman Catholicism. And if you move, keep moving to your right, chronologically, you'll see the green branch sprouting off of the Roman Catholicism branch. Sometimes uh, we refer to these two, the, the two main, Roman Catholicism as the Western Church, Orthodoxy as the Eastern Church, and um, as Protestants as part of that third major stream we are heirs of this Western Church, this Roman Catholic tradition, and her book emphasizes pretty much the, the Western um, branch, which is appropriate for us as Lutherans. Hey, before I start talking about this slide, let me make a correction about the previous one. The Protestant Reformation happened in the 16th century. That would be the 1500s. I misspoke in the last so slide and said 15th century. Wrong, wrong, wrong. 16th century Reformation. Remember it. All right. Early church dominion. There's our buddy Emperor Constantine in the upper right. And he is the guy who changed the course of Christian history in 313. You don't have to know very many dates for this church history class. 313 is one of them. Know it know what the Edict of Milan was, and know that it was uh, issued by Emperor Constantine. So prior to 313, uh, Christianity is a minority religion. Again, look at your chart and see just those pockets, or look at your map to see those pockets of areas, that dark pre peach. And these were the parts of the empire prior to 325 where Christians were the majority of the population. And you see that that's not very much of the empire. Um, Christians during this time, prior to 313, as a minority religion, sometimes were subject to uh, sporadic and local persecutions, which some to often led to arrest and sometime to martyrdom, to being put to death on account of one's faith. With Emperor Constantine and the Edict of Milan, uh, Christianity became a legal religion in the empire. And Christians came out into the open, and it became the done thing to become a Christian. It radically changed the number and the character of Christianity. And so we refer then to the... the Age, the, the time before 313 as the age of the martyrs, where martyrdom is the model of Christian holiness to which everyone would aspire, but probably not attain. When we have no more martyrs, we see the rise of the age of monasticism as a new model of holiness within the Christian church. 
both periods, the age of the martyrs and the rise of monasticism, are part of this broader period called the early church. And the sea change happened with the Edict of Milan in 313. Okay, finally, before the Edict of Milan, we have two primary texts that we are reading. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas, which I'll talk about more in our next mini-lecture, and then our reading for your next class period, The Passion of Saints Perpetua and Felicity. Um, we know that Perpetua and her companions died in the year approximately 203. We can date it because she mentions in her account that the martyrdom happened under a particular emperor in celebration of his birthday, and that's why we can be so accurate about the date. We also know that uh, Perpetua and her companions were from North Africa, and you can see uh, a couple of dark peach areas along North Africa, likely where she came from. The word martyr is a Greek word, and it literally means witness. So the martyrs were those who witnessed publicly to their faith. Um, and as we understand the term today, martyrs were those who were put to death for their faith. The question for us is why? What was it about the Christian faith that caused these bold Christians to be put to faith? Here's the story. Everyone at this time was required to make a sacrifice to the Roman Emperor. And at this time, the Roman Emperor was considered to be a god. Early on, earlier in the, in the time of the Roman Empire, uh, it was only after an emperor's death that he was declared to be a god. But by this time, the sitting emperor was considered a god, and everyone, as part of their patriotic duty to show their loyalty, made this sacrifice to the emperor um, for his good health and rule. Christians, being strict monotheists, some of them refused to make the sacrifice to the Roman Emperor. Jews, also monotheists, had special dispensation and were not required to do this. By this time, Christians and Jews had separated and Christianity was not given this privilege. And so those who refused to make the sacrifice to the emperor. And if you look at the illustration on the left-hand side, you see this, this is a carved relief of what that looked like, of the woman is, is placing her uh, offering of incense onto an altar there, and it was a public event. And some Christians refused to do that, and they were imprisoned, and some of them were a threat uh, and some of them were martyred because they were considered to be a threat to the empire. And that is why um, these martyrs became the model of Christian holiness. Here's a quote from Moore's book that I think um, illustrates this idea. She writes, It was not tens of thousands who were martyred, but rather tens of thousands who watched many hundreds bear witness to their faith. So martyrdom was the few, the proud, the bold, to which others then aspired. If you were, you know, if you were a teenager living in the early third century in North Africa, um, instead of uh, a poster of Britney Spears on your bedroom wall, you might have one of Perpetua. Okay, it's a crazy analogy, but go with it. Let me say a few more things about the early church period before I come back and talk more specifically about the martyrdom of Perpetua. After 313 we have this move from diversity to greater convergence in belief and practice within Christianity and the rest of our readings from in this chapter will cover areas of Christology, Christology Trinity, and the Church and look at this convergence of, of beliefs this time when um, the winners and losers uh, get sorted out. Athanasius is one of our primary texts titled On the Incarnation, 
and he he c carries the title preserver of the faith and we might call him the patron saint of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod. If you're curious why that is the case, I encourage you to go to the second floor of the Meyer classroom building, look for his plaque there, and read what it has to say. Um, we're going to cover what are called the ecumenical councils, the first four of them that took place in the fourth and the fifth century. First of all, let's figure out what that is. An ecumenical council is a worldwide gathering of bishops to address a pressing issue facing the church. And those pressing issues in the fourth and fifth century were issues related to the Trinity and to Christology. We see at this time, they happened after the Edict of Milan, um, that with an end to the external threat from the Roman Empire, that Christians kind of turned inward and the fights became internal and we begin to have winners and losers uh, um, among Christians. We'll end this chapter with the towering figure from the early church period, St. Augustine of Hippo. He lived in the 4th and 5th century. We'll read one book from his most famous, one of his very famous works, his Confessions, which will help us understand how monasticism became this model of holiness uh, in Christianity after the Edict of Milan. And then we'll also read some excerpts from his answer to the letters of Petillion, which will help us understand the Donatist controversy of the fifth century. And if you're also taking Lutheran um, confessional writings at this time, you may learn a little bit about, or you may learn a lot more about the Donatist controversy there as well. Back to the passion of Saints Perpetua and Felicity. Again, we've noted that they died in the early third century. Uh, they are exemplars of this model of Christian holiness in that time period, and they would have been considered traitors by the Roman Empire. I encourage you, uh, for every primary text, and beginning with this one, to use the printed re or the reading guide that is available in Blackboard for you. Uh, on this particular reading, I give you a list of the cast of characters, which is going to help you. So have that page open while you're reading uh, and, and refer to it so that you know who's who in her story. Let me talk also about the structure of the document. Uh, this is divided into paragraphs. And the first and second paragraph, when you start to read it, you're going to go, oh man, this is going to take me forever. They're very, it's difficult to read because um, she's using a very old translation of this text, which is more than 75 years old, therefore it's not under copyright and it's in the public domain. And these first two paragraphs are an introduction to the document written by an unknown editor. And they're pretty difficult to read. Slog through it, do your best. Okay, Paragraphs 3 through 10 are Perpetua's personal account of her arrest and what happened to her while in prison. Um, she has some wacky dreams and stuff. It's When you get to this part, it's easier to read. Then uh, paragraphs 11 to 13 uh, recount the story of Saturus and his arrest. He is their catechist. Um, the Perpetua and her companions were people, adults, studying preparing for baptism. The norm at this time in the Christian church was not infant baptism, but uh, baptism of adults. And so they were uh, in this period of instruction in the faith that led to baptism. And when they were arrested, Satoris, who had been their catechist, their instructor, turned himself in so that he could be with them uh, and provide them moral support and the um, maturity of, of Christian faith. Then the last section, paragraphs 14 through 21, provide the details of their um, imprisonment and also the eyewitness account of their deaths, again, by this unknown editor. So pay attention to that structure as you're reading, and I think that will help you navigate through this text that has some difficulties. As you read this first of our primary texts, I would like you to consider these questions and issues. 
First of all, what purpose for recording this story does the editor give in the opening and closing paragraphs, in paragraph 1 and paragraph 21? Again, these are some of the more difficult sections to read. Look at them carefully. See if you can discern some specific reasons given for recording this story. And then uh, we'll talk about that in class and talk about whether or not the, this text still has any value for us today. Um, I want to also point out why this text was chosen by uh, Rebecca Moore to be included, in part because it is this first-hand account uh, written by someone who was martyred rather than just someone witnessing a martyrdom. Um, and also, I think, in particular, because it is the account of a woman. And we're not going to read a lot of women authors in these primary texts. Women, uh, up until the postmodern period, were not encouraged to study theology, were not uh, major theologians, and so this is one of the few opportunities we have to hear the voice of a woman. Uh, and as you know, women now and women throughout its history have made up half of the church. Um, which leads us to this next question. What does the text tell us about the social status of Perpetua, of Felicity, um, particularly those two characters in this story? and You've got to read carefully to pick that out. We'll talk about this in class as well. And what might the social status of these women tell us about who was attracted to this new religion, this Christianity? And then we want to look at some theological issues that come up in relation to this text. One of those is the intercession of the martyrs. Um, read carefully the stories that Perpetua tells about her brother Dinocratus. What precisely is going on? Read it carefully. What issues does it raise? And we'll talk about that in class. Secondly, uh, we want to look at the meaning of death, the meaning of martyrdom. And here you need to read carefully uh, not only the visions and dreams that are described, but the opening paragraph uh, the opening of not paragraph 14, as is listed here on the slide, but paragraph 18 for clues. So what does this document tell us about the meaning of death? And then finally, uh, the challenge to the power of the empire. How does this story challenge the assumption that the Roman Empire is in control of its subjects? Think about that. And then, oh yeah, I do have one more question. This is really finally, finally, which is the last question on your reading guide for the day. And that is, did you find this story to be inspiring or disturbing? And think about that and come prepared to discuss that in class. I hope this has been a helpful introduction for you, and I'll see you in class. Excited to talk about the martyrdom of Perpetua.